sure. Go live. Boop. All right, going live on YouTube right now. Zoom software. So Casey, the beautiful part about this is I just have to show up and talk, and Timmy <laughs> does all the work on mm -hmm. this podcast. So it's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful division of labor. It's a nice. It's definitely a nice trade off. Cool. Uh, connect video source. We got it connected. Well, we had it on here on Facebook for a second. I know we're live right now on YouTube, so that's that's the good news. Um, schedule time. I'll go live right now. Come on, come on. Oh, there we go. So live video. Oh, it looks like. All right, so for some reason it's not working on Facebook, but we're live on YouTube. So we're just gonna go ahead and move forward. All right, let's do it. Sound good? Okay, cool. Countdown is happening right now. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, I got some glitch. Uh huh. <laughs> All right, get ready. All right, let's do it, Bo. Yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome to Commercially Speaking. Uh, my name is Timmy. Uh, this is my brother, Bo Barron, CCIM. And my brother, Timmy Barron, ADHD, and we are live for the... For the very first time, and we got a, a guest that's coming on in just a second. Uh, in in this podcast, Bo teaches me everything about commercial real estate. I know nothing about commercial real estate, which I don't know if I could say that anymore, Bo, because we're this is technically our sixth episode that'll be live. We've we've done several more, and I, I I'm feeling like the happy Gilmore of commercial real estate right now. <laughs> um, you know, comedy and, and acting is is my field, so uh, this has been quite a ride. <laughs> Well, it's been fun. And look, all this editing you've done of these episodes, it's like taking a, a college class on commercial real estate. So, yeah, you've amazed me with what you've picked up so far. I am, I'm amazing myself. And, uh, you know, that gives me a huge hit of dopamine. I feel really happy, good. My marriage is better. Like, everything is great. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. We've got a guest that's coming in today. Uh, Bo, who, who do we got? We've and got you know Casey Conway. Yeah, Casey Conway. Uh economist the the way i know casey is he's the chief at the ccim institute and uh, i'm an instructor there and um, you know i've got to see him speak at events ccim conferences i've gotten to know him over the years and so when we reached out to him a couple weeks ago to see if he'd be willing to join us on an episode he graciously accepted and so we're to have him join us here casey conway Show yourself, man. Let's see. Show yourself. It's saying I'm locked up here. Let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. Locked up. Great. Perfect. This is live, folks. This is live. <laughs> we got a still picture of me. I don't It was live. So, uh, yeah. We'll get it up. Hear, you can hear me. So, I've we got the cam you. open. So, I don't know why it just says um, cam off above it. So, I got the cam on, but then there's another pop up that says it's off. But 
All right, take um, click on, just click cam off, and then click the your camera source again. Yeah, it's still frozen. Yeah, it's still frozen. Huh? Uh huh. Okay. Ooh. Interesting. Interesting. We can hear you. That's good. We'd love to see your face, though. Love to see your face. Um, does it give you a choice when you click the cam button? Does it give you a choice of cameras? Uh, I don't see that. Let's see here. Let me look. Because mm -hmm. another thing that we could do is um, you could jump back into the studio if it we need to. Exit yeah, you can leave, come back in the link, and let's see if that works, okay? I'll do that right now. Okay, great. Right. Great. But what does he do? So, What's futurist mean? Futurist is he, he looks at the data, and he predicts what's going to happen. Uh, so it's not like he has a crystal ball or he's concocting potions or anything. Um, he just, you know, he has data look at the history and have a really good feel for what's coming, um, coming down the pike, so to speak. Oh. So yeah, a lot of times, uh, you know, I've heard futurists speak at conferences before. Uh, I think he's the first time I've heard an economist also kind of play that role as a futurist. So he's not afraid to tell you what he thinks is going to happen. So no. a lot of these economists will come in and they'll just interpret the data and uh, tell you what's going on. He'll tell you what he thinks is about to happen. And, uh, and he's not wow. afraid to name names and uh, really hear him speak. Yeah, because I, uh, I was doing a, a bit of homework last night, Bo, and I saw headline after headline of what's going on with commercial real estate uh, and the economy and the two that are joined and linked. And we talked about it a little bit with uh, Lonnie. And Lonnie came in, there he is. <laughs> yeah, we got him. Yeah. Oh, way more handsome than I thought. I'll, I'll touch. I'll touch no more buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're good now. So, uh, welcome. I was just asking Bo what you did, but I I wanted to say that Bo sent me a picture of you at the CCIM conference that happened, I guess, last week or the week before. And, yeah, last week in Boston. And we've talked about you a little bit before, but until I saw the picture of you and this picture of you, the the text that I wrote back immediately was nice shoes, <laughs> nice shoes. And I see behind you red shoe economics. Yeah. And so I. I, first of all, I think that's brilliant. Like that's brilliant marketing number one, but I'm curious as to, could you give us like a five minute origin story of, uh, how that came about? Like maybe your beginnings into this field and how it turned into what is now red shoe economics. It's a great story, but any of your listeners from Alabama won't like it if they went to the university of Alabama. So, uh, here's the original. <laughs> Red suede shoes, Woo. and what, what happened is in 2014, when I got hired by the University of Alabama to help uh, be the director of research and grow the real estate center up, I decided I should send a nice email to the dean. But see, I went to Emory University in Atlanta, and we thought the SEC was the Securities Exchange Commission, and so I didn't know what the hell this other SEC was all about. <laughs> so, so when I sent the dean a nice note saying, thank you, I, I, I found out they did something like, they think they play football over there. And uh, so I sent a nice note, but I, but I misspelled Coach Saban's name. Oh. So my, my probation period is I had to wear these for six months. And so when we, when we got all done, she said, okay, put away the red shoes. And then when they decided to lay me off during COVID, because they got rid of all the adjunct professors that weren't tenured, um, they hadn't copyrighted it. And so um, I said, well, you know, I'll just keep that. Uh, my, my business partner, Beverly Keith, had the good idea to, to keep it. So Red Shoe Economics came about because I couldn't spell Coach Saban's name. And now I wear <laughs> really hip red shoes. <laughs> yeah, those are the ones I saw. And I was like, nice yeah. shoes. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, brilliant. Uh, brilliant. So I tell my 12 year son, don't worry about spelling. The more you misspell, the more you may have a business someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that as somebody who does not smell, smell good at all. <laughs> you don't smell good either. I smell, I smell great right now. <laughs> right well, now. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, Casey, tell us what's your, what's your expertise and what are we talking about today? 
So I froze up again, but we'll leave it alone. Um, so I started out, I grew up in Colorado in a developer family. My, my dad was the land guy that put Vail, Colorado together. And that oh, came wow. about during uh, the Paul Volcker era when he decided to take interest rates to prime to 21%. So- um, And just throw out Paul Volcker. You gotta, you gotta explain. Who is Paul? So Paul, Paul Volcker was the, was the original guy that decided to, to teach us what high interest rates do to commercial real estate. So he, he took it from like where we are today to 21% in about a seven year period, shut the economy down. And he got a lot of interesting mail. Builders would mail him two by fours with all kinds of expletives and whatnot. But um, I, I wrote a piece about two years ago saying we're headed back that way. Um, uh, so that's where my futures come in. I could see what we're, what we're going towards, but it was the last time we really saw high interest rates. Most, most people, right, Bo, they don't, they don't remember that, that period of time, but yeah, my um, dad talks about it cause he was in the business back then. And right about the time I'm three, four years old around 1980 are those days that you're talking about. And, uh, Fed chairman at the time, correct? Yeah. Uh, Paul yep. Volcker was a Fed chair yep. and then he came back and they made a rule about him for the, uh, 2008, nine financial crisis. So, uh, and, and what's interesting, what's scary is the current Fed chair, Jay Powell, his mentor was Paul Volcker. Oh. So he, he thinks maybe the Volcker era is a good thing to bring back here, which scares, scares the bejesus out of me. That's an economics term, bejesus. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. But Jesus, I know how to spell that too. <laughs> Now, Casey, in a previous episode, we were talking about cap rates and I was going on about how it's the most misused term in commercial real estate and all this stuff. And we were, what Timmy taught me was that uh, cap is used in another way, like no, uh, no B, like no cap is no lie, no BS kind of thing. But y you have your own term for BS. Yeah. So um, I, you know, I grew up in Colorado. I've been in the South almost 40 years and I had to learn how to swear politely. And so what I learned, and I even use this in court trials is when something's just bullshit, you just call it barbecue sauce and <laughs> have a pine and have a pineapple on your desk. Cause that's a sign of hospitality. Um, so, so if you see in a post or something, or I say barbecue sauce, that's my polite way of saying that's BS. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Casey, the, the, this program just asked me to have you refresh your page and come back in because uh, right. apparently right now you're not recording. So let's just try that one more time and hopefully we'll go off without a hitch. Hopefully go off without a hitch. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Paul, do, hey, so do you know, do you know Paul Volcker? Do you know that name? Oh. Vaguely, you know, Vaguely. he was the okay. Fed chairman when I was, you know, probably four. Okay. And, there we go. Oh, there yeah. he is. It's just about every five minutes, something pops up that says it's not, not recording. Yep. So if it does that, I'll just keep coming and going. I'll kind of be yeah. like the fit. I keep coming and going in. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> well, look, that's kind of a perfect segue. And something I wanted to ask you about is, uh, I, I know about the fed cause I've been in commercial real estate for 20 years, but I couldn't really explain it to anybody. And Timmy being in the, you know, the actor comedian space knows little about the fed uh, last couple of weeks. So like, if you were trying to explain the Federal Reserve to a fifth grader, how would you do it? Yeah, it's kind of like turning everything in the household over to your brothers and sisters that know nothing about running a household. That's yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to end very well. <laughs> um, we have these people that are academics. They've never made a loan, fixed a loan, broke a loan. They've never bought a car. They've never bought a house. But now they're opining on all the policy that we should do to do everything in the economy, and they know nothing about it. And I can say that with integrity because I was in the Fed, both the Atlanta and New York Fed, 2005 to 10, during the last real nightmare. And I can tell you, these, these are all academics that know nothing of what they're, what they're preaching about. You know, and just, just think about this right now from what we're in. So we have Silicon Valley Bank failure that just blew everything up. And we're, we're gonna have a reincarnation of that here, I think next week. Um, I think we could have a First Republic Bank, all the indications are today, they may not make this week um, and whatnot. But Silicon Bank, uh, Silicon Valley Bank posted their 10K. So that's a document where you raise your hand and you say, mom and dad, I swear to God, I left the money in my piggy bank. And, and they filed their 10K to the SEC. And in that report, they said, if we have to mark all of our assets to market, all the things that we're holding that are fixed fixed rate stuff were insolvent that was the second week of january and nobody did a damn thing for two months and um and so it's just mind-boggling to me 
and, and that's what we really have. And the other thing is the San Francisco Fed, which is where Janet Yellen came from, our Treasury Secretary, and I, I knew her quite well. She didn't know anything about real estate either, still doesn't know anything about real estate or the economy. So it was her district bank that was supervising Silicon Valley Bank that allowed the entire venture capital world to be financed by one bank. Now, we don't do that with the auto industry, with the energy industry. So where the hell were these bank examiners in San Francisco um, un un supervising them? Where were they in reading the 10K and knowing they had a problem? And the other thing is, there's all these programs and, and vehicles that we have within the regulatory world that could have could have mitigated everything that happened. So one of them is deposits. Remember, the FDIC had to write a check for $40 billion or something for all the deposits and all the 10 rich billionaires that had their money in there. So there's a program called CDARS, C-D-A-R-S. And it's a program where if somebody wants to put $10 billion in a bank and they know they're only insured for 250000 the CDARS program has that bank distribute in $250,000 increments out to over 3,000 banks. And if they had done that, which is they're supposed to do, we would have never had any loss. But of course, the banks don't want to do that because they want all those deposits. You know, so if you go get a loan, right, Bo? What is the first mm -hmm. thing the banker says? Well, darn, I don't have all of your money. Give me all your money and I'll give you a loan. And so this you know, perverse behavior, the lack of bank supervision uh, is, is atrocious and the Fed should be fired. So how we got to a Fed, this is our third central bank. So believe it or not, we had two others that failed. And, uh, and so this one was concocted uh, on a trip over Christmas when Congress was out of session, Jekyll Island in Georgia, and they said, let's create this new central bank that, in my opinion, in all my research, it's unconstitutional. It's, it has no validity, but it has more power than Congress, than the president. I mean, they, they're, they're not even a third branch of government. They have more power than all three branches of the government. So it's something that, you know, before Donald Trump left the White House, instead of pardoning people, he should have had a boardroom and he should have fired the Fed, and then we all would be good shape. Yeah. Okay. So why did it come about? So, you know, we, we came out of this era, you know, you come out of the, the pre-Civil War, every state had its own currency and it was, it was just kind of like trading with Europe. How do I, you know, how do I trust this currency? Or, you know, does someone bring me 10,000 bales of cotton to get, you know, 3,000 fish or whatever? And so we needed to have a central a central currency, but how we got there and where you create all the central banks. So, you know, we, we have 12 of these central banks. And believe it or not, these central banks like the Atlanta Fed, where I'm at, or the St. Louis Fed, they're not they're not dot gov entities. They're their own private entities, and they can pay those their their oh. residents five hundred thousand, where poor Jay Powell only makes like two hundred thousand. And so the all the really? power is oh yeah. And so if you look at the if you go in and look at you know the different Fed district banks and what they're paid, you have ex, you have senior vice presidents are being paid more than than Jay Powell. So they can do anything they want. They have their own board of directors. Uh, most of them, you know, we had three of them that have had to step down because they've been investing financially when they shouldn't be. We had to fire the Dallas Fed. We had to fire, um, I guess it was the Chicago Fed and the Atlanta Fed. That person had to resign because um, they, they, they break the rules and invest in whatever they want. So uh, we have 12 of these districts. And so they're their own entity. And, and, and the, the compromise was, well, well, we'll put one twelfth of all the money in the country in each one of these banks. And so nobody has to worry that New York hijacked all the money in the country. It's spread around. They, do, they have input into the economy. So the agrarian economy has as much input or, or whatever is the Wall Street economy. And so here's an interesting trivia. So here's a good question for you, Bo, for, for a test somewhere down okay. the road. There's only one state in the entire union that has two Federal Reserve banks. Can you guess what it is? Texas, no, you, Washington, no, Alaska, California, nope, Missouri, uh, Missouri, oh, Kansas KC City and St. Louis, and St. Louis, the Kansas City is on the Missouri side, and so uh, think of the power that Missouri has with two Federal Reserve Reserve banks, and both their presidents are very solid people. I tell people if you want to know the truth in the economy, read the the minutes in the Beige Book, which is where they tell you what they think is going on uh, once a quarter. Uh, read on the interior banks like uh, um, Kansas City or St. Louis. So Esther George, who I knew really well, uh, she's retiring. Uh, Jim Boward has been on inflation right away. Um, these are the people. Do not listen to anybody from San Francisco or New York or the Atlanta Fed. They just don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So if I'm a – if Bo, did you have something? Uh, yeah, but go, go ahead with your question. I was going to say, if I'm an investor um, – what should what should I know right now about all these headlines that I'm reading, and um, should I what should I know as an investor 
or someone interested in investing in commercial real estate? What does this all mean to me? Yeah, so what it means right now is we, we have um, what the Fed has done to us with these rate hikes is they're essentially creating a complete capital lockup in our country. Um, there used to be a bank in North Carolina before it became Nations Bank and Bank of America was called North Carolina National Bank and the initials were NCNB. And I used to joke that was no cash for nobody. We have a no cash for nobody in commercial real estate right now, right? But you can't, you can't get a permanent loan. If you have a loan that's refining, the single most important thing is liquidity. And so if you're an investor in real estate, if you're a seller, if you're a buyer, you need to understand the capital composition because our industry is one that relies on a lot of debt capital. And what the Fed has said to the banks, and they get mad at me every time I say this, is they've told the banks that lending is economic activity. And economic activity is inflationary, so quit lending money. <laughs> so they want to shut the country down. They want to destroy their other mandate of full employment, which was the first mandate they got after World War II to get all the GIs reemployed. And so what we need to understand is capital is what makes our country and every industry, whether it's small business or real estate, we're a very you know, capital intensive industry in commercial real estate. If we don't have it, it locks up. So anything maturing, refinancing, a construction loan that's finishing that needs to go to the permanent market, it's all locked up. And so what the Fed does next week for its May, June, and July meetings is going to determine whether it's the end of the world or maybe we survive. I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? So this is all happening right right now. And so what, what's, what, what do you expect uh, next, to happen next week? I'm concerned. I think that the Fed's in a, in, a, in a rock and a hard place. So on one hand, we still have inflation. So even though we had CPI and PPI and all these indicators that, that tell us whether there's real inflation, what you got to understand is those um, measures are largely um, uh, played with quite a bit. It's like a, a, a game a game board. And so uh, there's different elements that go into it. There's food, there's housing, shelter. There's about you know a dozen items. And if, if the current administration and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Economic Analysis wants to say there's no inflation, so if housing was weighted 40% of all inflation and they want to get rid of that because housing is going up and apartment rents are going up, they say, well, let's just make it 20%. Ah, inflation went down. So there's so much manipulation that goes on in these inflation numbers. So um, uh, that, that's why I look at things like earnings report because all companies, the public companies have to raise their hand every, every quarter and swear under penalty of perjury to the SEC and tell us what's going on. So when PepsiCo tells us what's going on in earnings this week or Procter & Gamble or one of these companies that are buying materials and selling things, they know whether we have inflation. And so what, what my fear is we have what's called super core inflation. So you've heard of core and non-core and this is where they wanted to make up numbers. But super core are the things that really cause inflation that we spend 80% of our money on. There are wages, and our wages are going up because we can't get to go back to work. It's food, and primarily food at home. They call food at home groceries. It's shelter, in apartments or housing, and it's services. Um, and all of those things are running like seven to ten percent inflation. And if that's eighty percent of the real number, and that's what the companies tell us in their earnings, we still have an inflation problem. So is the Fed going to continue to raise interest rates, saying we're committed to getting rid of inflation, or are they going to say, well? The alternative is if we do that, we have the banking crisis from Silicon Valley Bank come back here in May, June, and July. So do we have a banking crisis or do we have an inflation crisis? And their, their, um, their tools are very limited in what they can do. So we're either going to have a banking crisis over the next three months or we're going to have, um, you know, see if we can do something about inflation. So it's a really difficult thing. And since all these idiots have never done anything in the real economy, I'm, I'm really doubtful they'll do the right thing. And they'll raise interest rates because that's all they know how to do and they're data dependent. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like an old person is depends dependent. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm getting close to that age. I'm 60. So I, I just don't think uh, they're doing it. And they don't look at real data. So they look at all this rear view mirror data. They look at bad government data that's manipulated. I look at forward looking indicators. So as Bo knows, we created in the CCIM Institute a really cool tool. We created it two years ago. I was involved in, in the co-creation. It's called Creppy. And most people think it's a bait fish, you know, that you use to go catch other fish. Or you can go, but it's not crappy, it's crappy for a commercial real estate performance index. So when we put it together, we decided to get together in Georgia, uh, get some canoes and banjos and float down the river with some beer. Oh, yeah, that was a movie already done. <laughs> we, did meet, we, did meet in, we did meet in North Georgia and we did consume some alcohol, but we sat down for a long period of time. And our goal was to see if we could find just 10 simple indicators 
that all look out the window, like University of Michigan Consumer Confidence or um, you know, the, the Commercial Property Price Index, the companies that look at like CoStar and, and RCA and Greenseed that look at what's happening in prices. Could we find 10 of those, put them together in an algorithm that's very predictive? So we did that and, um, uh, and you can go to site2dobusiness.com forward slash crepi, C-R-E-P-I, and it's all free and it's all transparent, unlike the Fed. And so we back tested it back to the last century and we never missed a downturn or an uptick in the market in in the past decade. Looks like this thing's going away. I need to come oh, back. Oh, there it is. Me. No, yeah. there we go. Nice. And so you can see last year we uh, hit the all time record uh, low. Um, we're bouncing off 82 or 83, but um, the data is a little bit lagged because all of them come at different times. So by the time we get to the, the real March or April data, my forecast is we'll go below the record low 80 and we'll go into the 70s. But this is very intuitive, it's very transparent. You can look at the 10 metrics. And um, so this is what I look at. I, I've offered it to the Fed. There's the 10 like there. They're all windshield. They're all looking forward. And the Fed doesn't look at anything windshield. They're all looking at the rearview mirror. I, I, I want to know who their driving instructor was in high school because we need to just make sure they're fired. <laughs> so, so, that's, so I look at those type things. I'm very private industry data because it's the current stuff. It's not surveys. It's not the, you know, the, the jobs numbers. So it's a household survey where the Bureau of Labor Statistics talks to a thousand people at home with a landline. Who the hell are they talking to yeah. to tell us this is what the jobs are? So what I look at are things like ADP that process all our payrolls. I look at things like Challenger Grade that looks at all the job cut layoffs. This is real time, every bit of data. If we could get the Fed to look at that, they might have a chance of getting it right. But I think they're going to raise rates in in, uh, in May uh, or here in, the, in next week. Um, they might be inclined to pause in June or July because they're starting to see the demand destruction. And I think if they raise in May, we put about 200 banks over the cliff that are probably going to fail. And then okay. we have a real I want to get into the banking stuff, but let me ask you a couple clarifying questions. Um, CPI is the consumer price index, kind of measures inflation. Um, but you also mentioned PPI and I'm sitting here thinking, and I hear that term PPI, all that, what, what's that one actually stand for? <laughs> These are all acronyms from daycare. <laughs> the kids do a PPI. <laughs> so the consumer is what the consumer is supposed to doing, but it's very manipulated. And the, you have to read the footnotes and see how they reweight things and change whatnot. But that's supposed to be what the consumer is doing. It's not, I'll give you another one. I mean, I'll give you another acronym, the PCE. Uh, the personal consumption measure, but PPI is the producer price index. So people that make things and manufacture things, we really want to pay attention to their inflation because that's what gets passed on to the consumer. Mm. So that's why I look at Procter and Gamble and Pepsi and what's the input cost of Frito chips and Coca-Cola. If those are all going up, that tells me that's coming into CPI and CPI is not tamed. And we're seeing on the production side, all of those input items are still going up, you know, five to 8% a quarter. Wow. One that's the Fed's favorite that should be right, that they should look at, but they don't understand a certain behavior mechanism. It's called PCE, the personal consumption expenditures. So they look at what the consumer is spending their money on, like groceries and gasoline, and saying, what's happening to that? The problem is what consumers are doing right now is they go to the grocery store and they see that you know the, the, the price of one steak is what they used to get four for. And so they can't afford steak. So what do they do? They buy chicken or they buy you know, pork. They buy something cheaper. They do a substitution. So the Fed says since they came to the store to spend 250 bucks and they're still spending 250 bucks, ah, there's no personal consumption expenditure inflation. It's so they're substituting goods. Um, so if the kid wants the Coke or Pepsi product, but they can't afford the brand, they buy a, a generic brand to bring the price down for the, the soda or Gatorade's too expensive. And now mm -hmm. it's whatever. So that's the flaw in the Fed's PCE is they're ah. not discovering the change in the behavior for the basket of goods. So none of them are really very good. And that's why I look at the earnings reports, because these companies are telling us straight down out what, what's happening, what their input costs are, what they're around the world. And so my, my indicator I look at most for inflation is what's, what these companies are telling us out of earnings. Oh, wow. Okay. You, we've had those two bank failures. You mentioned we might have another one next week. And I also heard you um, talking last week in Boston where, uh, you know, you mentioned the Texas ratio. And so what I'd love for you to do is like, give us like a, a 60 second lesson on what the Texas <laughs> ratio is. And then, you know, are, are we, are we in for a much bigger 
you know, what I hear in the news is we had those two big bank failures. Nothing's happened since then. We're probably just fine. And you don't seem to agree with that. No, and we get more confusion that because of the bank earnings last week and this week. So big ones like U.S. Bank or PNC, uh, Huntington Bank shares that don't do crazy things. They don't do too much real estate. They don't do venture capital. They're really, you know, down the road, well balanced. They've all come out and said, hey, we're, we're great. So everybody thinks, oh, the banks are all OK. Now we're getting into the regionals and some of the smaller you know, banks and they're saying mm, we have a problem like a truest bank. Right. And Truist says, oh, my God, we, we can't make money. Our expenses are way up. We look like SVP in terms of all the fixed assets that we have on our balance sheet, like mortgages and all that. And so uh, their CEO says, I don't have a clue how to grow a bank, so I'm just going to cut the hell out of everything. <laughs> I'm not going to grow anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what the Texas ratio is, is we got to go way back to the 1980s. Um, right after bell bottom pants and wide, wide, uh, wide uh, neckties. And, you know, we had phones with Starsky and Hutch that were the size of, I don't know, a sewing machine. <laughs> we got to go back to that era. And what the Texas ratio did is when we had the SNL crisis and we had the energy, the oil patch, is a couple of smart folks said, let's just see if we can predict who's going to go next. So they said a really good predictor would be we'll take all those risky assets that are on a bank that they got to mark to market and they haven't marked them to market. And let's look at what they aggregate as a percentage of their total assets. Makes sense, right? So a bank only has a dime of capital. People think the banks are all well capitalized. They have a dime. Anything drops 10%, they're wiped out, they're gone. They're not well capitalized. So when you see those risky assets become more or at 10% of their total capital, that means they're insolvent. They're essentially insolvent. That's what SVP says. And so we have a lot, a lot of walking dead banks and we haven't even dealt with the banks that have real estate concentrations. So we call them CRE concentrated banks. And what that says is that they have more than 300% of that dime. So if they have 30 cents of commercial real estate for the dime of capital, they're CRE concentrated. All those banks haven't marked these assets to market yet. They haven't gone through the cap rate change. I mean, talk about what that cap rate mystery is. Um, we can give Timmy a really good when I came along, we had a, my dad had a really good explanation of cap rates. They're always 10% plus or minus two. So in a recession, you add two. In a good time, you subtract two. Now we don't know what it means. But really, all a cap rate is, is it's the inverse of a stock multiple. So, you know, we know if, if a company's multiple is growing, it's getting bigger in value. If it's shrinking, it's going less in value. Well, the same thing, if you inverse that, the same thing happens with cap rate. So when things are great and there's a lot, lot less risk, the cap rate goes down that NOI is worth more. If it's going up, that means a lot of bad stuff's happening. So a cap rate is just an indication of risk. And so you can look at companies in your own market, in your building, um, you know, uh, in certain industries that you're exposed to, and just look at what's happening to the stock multiple. And if it's shrinking, which is what's happening in tech, because if we present value those inflated to come earnings at a, at a higher number, right, it's not worth as much. And so I, I tell people it, it's that. So somehow, Bo, we got to a point where we said cap rates are five plus or minus two. And I think we're going back to <laughs> 10 plus or minus two. Um, so anyway, on the bank side, so Texas ratios take your risk assets that haven't been marked to market. It means they can wipe out all your capital. What are they a percentage of your capital? And it, when it gets to five, five percent, you need to start raising capital. It's really hard for a bank to raise capital. It gets anywhere near 10. You're, you're essentially insolvent. Well, we have banks right now that are, you know, 12, 20, 30 percent Texas ratios, and they're in every state. So no one's immune. Even Florida has some that has Texas ratios that are whack. So it's still maintained today. Most people don't know it. There's a, a website called deposits, uh, depositaccounts.com. It's maintained by LendingTree. You can just Google Texas ratio and it'll take you to deposits.com. It's maintained by LendingTree. And it pre-calculates the Texas ratio for every bank and credit union in the country. Why do we need bank supervision? Just go look at the damn Texas ratio yeah. and it'll tell you which banks are going to fail. Yeah. And so when I look at that, we've got two to 300 that are over 10%. We're wow. walking dead. And so if the Fed raises rates more, they make that problem worse. And are they going to punt like they did on SVB and not take them down? Or are they going to take them down? And, you know, we have 5,000 banks in the country. So the Fed's attitude is kind of cavalier. Ah, so we lose 1,000 banks. So when I was out there 2005 and 10, and we lost 500 between 2009 and 2011, the Fed's attitude was, yeah, we got, then we had like 6,000 banks. So let's get it down to 1,000. You know, Canada is like five. <laughs> and so they don't understand that those banks 
They're largely community banks that may be the only bank that's lending in a community like Quad Cities, Iowa, or you know, Wichita, Kansas. And so if that bank fails, that's the only banking in that community or market. And the Fed doesn't get this because they don't, they don't do on-site bank exams anymore. They don't get out and, and see things very much. And so that's what worries me is these guys just don't know how to connect the dots. But I look at the Texas ratio. It's a predictor of who's going to be at risk for failure next. It's also important for us, Bo, as we talked about in, in uh, Boston, to, for everybody doing a real estate transaction to know the Texas ratio of the bank that's involved in the financing of the transaction that's happening. Because if you're doing business on a transaction with a bank that has a you know, 10% Texas ratio, they're probably not going to be at the closing table in 90 days. And then a deal that you worked on for six months to a year blows up, not, not because of you or the buyer or the seller or the tenant, but because no one was paying attention. So I tell everybody right now, if you're doing a commercial real estate transaction, you need to go look at the Texas ratio for the banks that are involved in that transaction. Wow. Did you know any of this, Bo? Well, I listened to him talk about it last week. So <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> from, Bo from, knows. yeah, well, from, I'm curious, like from listening to that, have you gone to check the banks that you have, uh, that like on the last syndication deal you did, did you go and look at the Texas ratio of that bank? I do no. look at it probably two times a day, but I don't know Bo, if you, yeah. if you look at it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, of course, the last deal we did like that was a almost, well, it was, it was right before all the rate hikes started. And so, and nobody was worried about the banks, at least right. not in my town, you know? Well, is um, that something that, that you would, Casey, is that something you suggest Bo do with a, with a transaction he's already done? Should he go look at that bank or is he safe because it was before that? No, it's kind of like we need to check our weight every once in a while to see how many calories we're taking in. We should check the Texas ratio every day for in, yeah. in real estate. Or really, if you're a small business, if you're any kind of entity business, you need to know what's going on in your bank and whether they're going to be there with it. So I, I just did a post today on American Express, the most anti-small business entity in America that's going right back to their playbook from 2009. So I got an email while I was in Boston, Bo, where American Express said, we're reviewing your account for contraction of your credit. And I'm like, wait a yeah, minute. You mentioned this credit. on the stage. Yeah. I got a great credit score. My credit utilization is only like 25%. I'm a 26 year client. I pay more than I need every month or whatever. And I call them I'm like, what's going on? They go, well, it's just. <laughs> Good job, Casey. <laughs> okay, got so, it. So I raised hell and they said, well, if you would just make a double payment for April, we'll make sure we don't do anything. So I said, it's, it's a hostage thing, fine, screw it. I don't need a problem, I'll pay it. So this morning when I wake up, I get this notice from American Express, I'm a small business and you know we use our American Express Sky Miles card to buy our travel and all that. And they said, we, we've contracted your credit by 75% just because. And I said, my credit score didn't change, my utilization didn't change, I paid on time, why are you doing this? And they, they transferred me to three people and after an hour they dropped off and wouldn't talk. So I did a post. We need to remember what happened in 2009 and 10, right, Bo? So all these businesses and all these households, home equity line of 50,000 or 100,000 that had credit cards that said you got a 10,000 unused balance. All the banks engaged in bad behavior, the big banks, the Wells Fargo, and oh, they man. contracted everybody's credit. I, one, of, one of my mentors, he's passed away um, since this happened, but in 2009 or 10, probably, uh, he was with BB&T which be, is now SunTrust, Truist. or yeah. Truist, rather. Yeah, they merged with SunTrust and now they're Truist. They called his, all of them, millions of dollars. And I, I was having lunch with him, and he was telling me about his morning and, and how they called and said, look, we're, we're calling it all. And he looked at me, he's like, I'm probably the only guy in town that they could do that to, and I could actually go write him a check. But, like, they're – you know, just the business practice of it. Like he never did business with them again, but yeah, that's, that's scary. Yeah. That just all of a sudden that could happen, you know? So check out my LinkedIn post today. I, I railed on American Express and here's the thing they don't know. So I know the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. I was there when we created them <laughs> the nightmare. It's part of why I left the Fed in 2010. And, you know, and I still briefed it. The, the bank regulars still have me come in every quarter. And I, and I ask them, why don't they fire me? Because I criticize the hell out of them. I, you know, I swear barbecue sauce at them. And I briefed <laughs> them the week before Silicon Bank failure. And I said, you guys have no idea when commercial real estate reprices because cap rates going up, you have a huge problem. 
and you, you're probably looking at a couple of 300 bank failures. That was the week before it failed. Wow. And they had no idea what I was doing. I had all the conference of state bank supervisors, the FDIC, the Fed, totally clueless. And the same thing's happening right now that you want to really create and cement a relationship for, I mean, a, a recession forecast. You pull the credit on small business and small businesses, most of their their funding is variable rate. It's not fixed rate. So, but we're worrying about, wow, now we got to pay 7% on a loan or whatever for commercial real estate. These small businesses are paying 12 to 14% or they're like me. I'm putting my travel on American Express. I'm hoping my client pays me on time. My, my lawyers and lawyers never pay on time, you know? And, uh, and, and so if I don't and I have to carry any, I'm paying, you know, even on American Express with good credit, I'm paying 12 to 14%. So now that goes to 14 to 18 to 20%. That's all the margin in small business. They're out of business. And this is the stuff that our central bank and the Fed should care about that they're doing nothing about. So that was my rail on American Express today. You know, if you can get rid of American Express and go, you know, get a community bank, get a credit union, because it's the community banks and it's credit unions that fund our local communities. They know us. They know our market. Mm. They were all the way through in COVID. Um, so I tell people, if you haven't hugged a community banker or a credit union lately, go hug one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, well, that's been my experience the uh, last 15 years. Probably 90% of the deals that we've done in Western Kentucky have been community bank funded. Like, yeah, they're yeah. the people that are plugged in and that provide me. But I did want to ask you this because you, you mentioned it last week. You were, um, you know, I, Timmy and I, our parents, we grew up in a, in a real estate household. So my dad was a developer and a commercial real that's the business that, that I have now. Our mother owned a Century 21 franchise. And at the time, at a certain time, it was the largest one in the state of Kentucky. And so, you know, we just grew up in that kind of household. My mom, location, location, location. Mm -hmm. Last week, yeah. though, you were mentioning LTC. Will you explain a little bit to us about LTC? Yes, I grew up in the same era. And so my dad... You know, my, I'm a third generation MAI, so I was condemned in my DNA to be a dumbass appraiser. So I fought like hell to get out of there. <laughs> I became an economist to not be a dumbass appraiser. <laughs> and, and the appraisal institute on my MAI, they burned me in effigy every six months when I say that. But um... <laughs> you deserve it, Casey. You deserve it. <laughs> that's why that's why i wear this bow i don't wear my mai pin anymore um so so my dad said look there's just two things you need to know so i mentioned the cap rate he said all you need to know about cap rates don't worry about the cap rate courses just 10 percent plus or minus two he said the other thing is if you understand location in real estate that's all you need to know location 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 well what i've learned is it's not location location it's ltc location timing and capital and you can have the best location, the best tenant, the best building. And if the timing's bad, like right now, you're screwed. And then if there's no capital, you're double screwed. And so we have a T and C problem right now um, that most don't understand it. So I tell people, you, you need every day. It's kind of like, you know, you got two side mirrors and you got a one rear view mirror. So it's location, timing, and capital. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, really I good. thought that was, that was really, really smart. Like that, that landed with me just the way you framed that. And, uh, and yeah, I definitely wanted you to mention it. Um, Quite literally we... framed it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's good. Really good. I, I think in pictures. So <laughs> that was, yeah. That's the way I am. You know, I yeah. was um, dyslexic. And so if you get an email from me, the, the V is always spelled T, T E H and and is A D N. Yeah. And I don't know why the keyboard can't, can't fix that. But um, it was it was really hard. And so I'm a very visual learner. And I yeah. think most real estate people, wouldn't you say, Bo, we're very visual. Um, oh, I think look so. At the property. Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, that's why we had cocktail napkins. So we put the numbers in the four corners and then yes or no in the middle because we were very visual on, on what yeah. we do. Some, some you know, uh, millennial puts a Argus in front of us that they don't even understand what they input there. And so we go back to let's visualize these numbers, you know, and I, I always am trying to trying to visualize it. So Timmy yeah. Argus is this program essentially that underwrites properties in a super mega sophisticated way. And to work the program, you have to go take a course just just to figure out how to put things into it. I, I don't know how to do it. Um, but yeah, it's that's the technical term too. super mega sophisticated underwriting.
supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Yeah. <laughs> For you, Timmy, there, there's the rest of the musical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Yep. That's Argus. <laughs> that is. Right? You, you know, Argus. Music, music, a picture, and a food smell. We can learn anything. I don't know why in school they're not baking chocolate chip cookies, you know, or, you know, letting us look out the windows because we can right. remember that. Or, yeah. or have music. Then we'd all learn. <laughs> yes. That's so true. God, that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Oh. Well, Timmy. Yeah. Any, any questions before we transition here? How do we fix all this? How do we fix all this? How do we get the Fed to listen to you? What, when will they learn? Um, why does it have to go through a recession for it to be fixed? Like that? Why? 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 What? The the Fed's the Fed's got to have a good reason, right? Like, you know what? Like, the Fed's not doing this because they they know that it what they're doing sucks. Uh, Timmy's presupposition is that the Fed is inherently good. Well, I think I, I, no, not necessarily. Well, I think the benefit of the doubt. If we were to get the benefit of the doubt, okay, right. The yeah, so, so like they're not just. I mean, maybe they're just evil, right? But it. it you understand what I'm asking? Like what? Yeah, walk, so okay. I got, I got a great answer for you. So okay, your mom, your guys are in the South. Kentucky's part of the South, right? Even though. Yeah. The Fed doesn't understand what is north and south. Uh, Kentucky is in the St. Louis Fed, so wait a minute, they're in the Midwest. But anyway, your mom or grandma probably had a saying to someone that didn't know what they were doing or functioning that was called, well, bless their pee-picking little heart, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're yeah. just a dumbass, right? Yeah. You're, you're well-intentioned, but you don't know what you don't know. The Fed is, well, bless their pee-picking little heart. They don't know their academics. They, they worked on their PhD until they were in their 40s. They waited on tables, they lived off mom and dad. They've never worked in a real job. They've never had to make a payroll, figure out a business, uh, make a, a conviction about, I'm gonna invest in something. You know, the Fed can't invest in anything. They all have to just have a blind you know, bond fund or whatever. So these people have no industry experience. And the way we fix it is, we need to get a central bank that is at least you know, a third to a half composed of industry experts. How about a Warren Buffett on the damn thing, you know? Right, or, yeah. You know, some of these really, you know, good good people, or Bo, you know, or, or, you know, someone from the CCIM or our leaders that understand this stuff or whatnot, but there's no industry experience. And so when I sat in there for five years, I was the only appraiser in the history of the Fed and the only MAI to ever serve to explain to them about real estate and how it functioned. And this is a true story you'll get a kick out of. So you may go way back, so to me, Believe it or not, before the great housing crisis, 2008 or 9, the banks weren't reviewed or examined on a consistent basis. Huh. One bank might have been reviewed 10 years ago, another one just recently. So we had no idea how our banking system was performing, so we created this idea of stress tests. Let's stress test the biggest, largest banks every year on the same issues to see if they have enough capital. So we implemented um, these stress tests. So the first ones that were supposed to come out in 2009, they were supposed to come out in the fall, and they had to be stalled. And I was, I was culpable for that vote. So the examiners come back and they say, great news, Chairman Bernanke. The, the residential mortgage crisis is all contained, contained to residential and it won't affect commercial real estate at all. And being who I am and my Irish roots and growing up out west and not knowing how to swear politely yet in the south, I led a Colorado expletive out. And it was the real thing that you put your cowboy boots in. <laughs> <laughs> and so Chairman Bernanke says, wait a minute, Casey, what are you talking about? So we spent two or three hours trying to draw out of the examiners that had gone out and done these initial stress tests. How is it that they concluded? the commercial real estate would be unaffected by everything that was happening in residential. Huh. So finally, Bernanke said, well, Casey, tell them why you're thinking this way. And I said, well, and Bo knows this. So commercial real estate follows the rooftops. So a shopping center, they don't go build a grocery store out in a farm field. They wait until there's 10,000 houses and then they'll build a shopping center and then they'll build doctor's offices. So I said, if there's nobody moving into these subdivisions and households and commercial real estate thinks they are and they're building stuff, commercial real estate's gonna crash and burn. And in 2009, mm -hmm. the whole CMBS permanent market crashed and burned. So I said, it has to, I said, so I said, let me try to draw out from these examiners why they think this way. So this one examiner, state examiner, he raises his hand and he goes, there's this thing in these loans 
And it says that if the condo is not selling, if the subdivision is not selling, if the apartment's not leasing up, the bank has to give the developer money. And I said, are you talking about an interest reserve? So this is if a, if a project finishes and maybe it's hitting the market just wrong. Most loans after the 1970s and 80s, we said, let's have a cushion. So for 12 months or 18 months, we'll advance the funds to pay the interest so it's not uh, a non-accrual or impaired loan and causing sure. problems with banks. But it runs out after 12 or 18 months. And under gap accounting, it says it's an impaired loan. So I said, do any of you know what gap accounting is? Your bank examiners are supposed yeah. to know this. I said, it's a freaking impaired loan. It's going to crash and burn 12 to 18 months later. So the chairman agreed with me and said, we got to go redo all the bank stress tests. So if you remember in 2009, they didn't come out in 2009. We had to wait till 2010. And I was responsible for them to have them go back out there and over the holidays, re-examine and stress test all the banks. So a group of state bank examiners out of New York said, this just ticks me off. I'm going to miss the holidays. So I had to do a presentation explaining all this. And so one of them said, let's just leak it to the media and they'll put a timeout on all this and we'll do it, you know, in the winter. So they leaked my whole presentation to the Wall Street Journal. Oh. And it was it was the front page of the business section. Um, and so I'm sitting there in my, you know, in my Atlanta Fed and or New York Fed office. And all of a sudden security comes in. They usher me out of the building. Um, I go home, my, my credentials, my security credentials are pulled. I go, go home and I try to pull in the driveway, but there's all these dark colored Ford cars that are on the street and in my driveway. They're taking computers out of my house. They're doing search warrants. They thought I leaked it. And uh, so it took about a month to figure out who really did leak it and, and to restore my, my credentials. And so the apology I got from Chairman Bernanke is he invited me back. He said, I apologize, would you like a bear claw donut? So Bernanke likes bear claw donuts and when he wants to make up for something he screwed up, he invites you to a bear claw donut. But that's how incompetent they had no idea how construction loans work. They didn't understand an interest reserve. They didn't understand why commercial real estate was gonna blow up. And I was the only one. And if I hadn't been there, that dot would not have been connected probably for another two years. Wow. And the whole thing would have been worse. And that's what scares me right now is that the Federal Reserve influences the type assets that a bank has to hold. So Silicon Valley Bank was built on a business model, high risk, fund all the venture capital in the world, all these high risk businesses that could crash and burn at any time. So the San Francisco Fed said to Silicon Valley Bank, you need to hold really safe liquid assets. And the bank said, OK, what are those? Oh, well, 10 year treasuries, they're very liquid, they're very safe. So they load up on 10 year treasuries that then have to be marked to market and aren't worth a damn thing. The Fed created the whole damn problem in Silicon Valley Bank. And we don't let one industry or one company be financed by one bank. And for the first time since, you know, I guess, you know, before the, the great housing recession and maybe going back to the 80s, did we allow one industry and one bank to finance it all? And so these fundamental things that were missed in bank supervision and, and, and there is no accountability for it. The whole the whole bank supervision should be overhauled. We should require that a third of all the appointments and whatnot be real practicing business leaders mm -hmm. that have high integrity. And when you build in industry experience, you know this, Bo, you know, if you're going to have a partner and you know, I have a partner, I don't have a government, you know, or an academic on my partner. I have a real world, someone that compliments oh, yeah. To, to know what's going on. We don't have that in the Fed. It's academic. And it's so bless their pee picking little hearts. They don't know what they don't know. And I don't know how to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Casey, to, to your point, um, I got a call yesterday <clears throat> from somebody I met in Boston who, um, who passed her exam and got her, got her designation her CCIM. Designation. And she calls me and, um, she says, look, we've got a site here that might be great for self storage. And we love self storage. And it's down in um, in the Nashville. And so I, I pull it up online, and I've got uh, a partner in Nashville that I do some stuff with. And uh, and I ask him, I call him up, and this is what I ask him. Is it, because from the aerial, it looks like it's between two population centers. And what I want to know is, are there a whole bunch of rooftops filling in in between? Because I don't want to put a self-storage facility somewhere before yeah. the rooftops are there. Yep. Like your absolute development, the commercial side of things, it follows those rooftops. Um, last thing I'd want to be is be the first one in there. I mean, yep. maybe I get lucky, but probably it, it'd be a terrible idea. So, yeah. yeah.
Yep. Well, that's where economic base analysis comes into play. So you can see the future rooftops that are coming in, right? Yeah, that's yeah. true. So, so Bo yeah. knows we have, in CSAM, we have really good tools. We have this thing called Site to Do Business. It's a really powerful market analytics tool, and it's partnered up with something called Esri. So it brings all the pictures. So you, you can visualize the aerial or the rooftops or the things you want. So uh, on that line, Bo, I had one with um, Dollar General. So they were they were trying to get another Dollar General store done in, in between areas in, in a city in, in Alabama. And unless it has an X or an O on it, they don't approve it. It has to have an X or an O. It's all football in Alabama. And so um, what we were found, what we found in using the site to do business data is in the gap analysis, which it tells you where you have a gap in something. Where is where's a use that's not being served? And so you see what they call leakage. So people leave this area and they go over here to buy their stuff. Timmy knows stuff. leakage. You know, Timmy leakage. knows leakage. I yeah. know leakage. <laughs> I know leakage in more ways than one. There you go. And it's not just for senior senior living facilities. But anyway. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so we, we, we got to this county and the council that was going to turn this Dollar General down and showed them how much tax revenue they were losing. And this is where the demand was. And so those are tools that people like CCIMs have. We can visualize it. We can do the analytics. We can quantify it. So we got the deal. We almost had it approved, but there was one holdout, one influential county commissioner. And I said, well, what's your problem? We've proven everything. What's your problem? He goes, I just don't like the color yellow. And I said, really? Are you going to restripe all your roads? Because I don't like the color yellow you have in your town. So if you don't allow Dollar General, then I think we need to have you restripe all your roads. And he goes, oh, my God. All right, we'll let it go. So when I showed him that the yellow on their roads for striping was the same as Dollar General, they got the deal approved. So sometimes <laughs> we just have to rethink our brain and how we get something done, right? That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I like well, look, the way you think, on... Casey. <laughs> well, they, they say I'm crazy, and I say I agree, but usually I'm crazy right. That's why my business card I put that I'm a, I'm a futurist, and it's not because really I think I'm that smart. I take the time, like Bo knows, CCIMs are trained to connect the dots. Most of what we do is common sense and connecting the dots. And so if you take anything away from commercial real estate, it's common sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, your gut's right. And if you can't connect the dots, and that's why I always triangulate. Before I make an opinion, I want to see three confirming independent kind of data sources that affirm that conclusion. If I don't have them, uh, you know, I, I triangulate. So, rich economists, you see there's some triangles in my logo behind there. Lots of triangles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, Timmy, you ready for a pop quiz? Oh, I sure am. All right. <laughs> a bit la- a bit laggy but it's there all right let's, all right let's start the quiz let's start the quiz i'm ready okay so casey the way we do this is i'm going to ask timmy five questions however you can i mean these questions can be for uh from you as well you can participate here so let me lob the first one in and then um and then maybe uh Maybe you can go next. So my first question is, as Casey was sharing with us earlier about the Federal Reserve, (laughs) how many districts does the Federal Reserve have? Twelve. Twelve is correct. Timmy was paying attention. (laughs) I was. I was. That's my favorite thing to hear at the end of these. I was... You were listening. Yes. yes, I was. Yes, I was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Casey, do you have a question for Timmy? Yeah. So um, I, I, like to, I like to wear a certain color shoes. What, what color shoes do I, does, a, does the blank shoe economist wear? <laughs> Alabama. Talk about Alabama. There's a coach. <laughs> I'm going to say a red, red You're shoe right. kind of. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my daughters and wife are worried because I have more red shoes than them. I've got 12, 12 <laughs> pairs of red shoes right now. If we, really wanted, if we really wanted to trick them, the original pair were all birds. And all birds are a great concept. They were wool leather up, up tops. So they're, they're now they started like, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And they still can't make a profit. 
12 oh. years with a great concept, 250 million in revenue, and they're still not profitable. Oh, That's the side note of a company we don't invest in. That yeah. is correct. Yeah. Okay, I have another, another question about the Fed. Casey mentioned three particular Fed districts that, I don't think he used these words, but this is what I got out of it, that they're absolutely train wrecks. Mm -hmm. Do you remember which, which three he... Yeah. M Missouri, wait, Missouri, Kansas City, that was, that was two, that was the two in one place. Right, yep. Um, Texas? Use, use your right brain and your left brain. <laughs> okay. okay. Was it, um, was Texas one of them? In Kentucky, what are the three places you'd never take somebody hunting with you if they were from? <laughs> uh, hold on, let me look at my notes here. Because I, I feel like I wrote down. Janet Yellen came from one of them. You got him on this one, though. I have. Yeah, That's... I'm in. I'm in one of them, and the other two, you would never take someone from these locations with you hunting in Kentucky. Am I okay. right, though? That is very true. Very true. So would that be? Um, I don't know where you where you are. Missouri is that one of them? No, nope. no. In the uh, south. In the south. Um, Alabama. Atlanta. <laughs> uh, oh yes, yeah. So we got Atlanta. Um, I remember now because you said Atlanta, uh, and I actually I didn't write this. Atlanta, Chicago. No, no. it's nope. bad. But um, Atlanta. Look at where you, people are moving from. Where are they moving from? To the biggest places. Nashville. Nashville. And they're moving out. Moving Nashville's out. where they're moving to. Oh where yeah. Where are they moving from? Oh. Sh mm. Nancy uh, Pelosi moved in one of them. <laughs> oh well. Oh goodness. Oh goodness. Um, the movie industry used to be near one of them. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, New uh, California. Yeah, Alcatraz. San yeah, yeah. San California. Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco. Um, uh, and then the one by Seattle? Central Park. Oh, New York. There New you York. Go. New York. Go. Yeah. New York. San Francisco. And Atlanta. And Atlanta. All right. So I mean, that was that. I. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. I can't get them all. Can't get them all. Um, I do. I. Nah, I was that. That I. I remember not writing that down. Um, to catch what else Casey was saying. So anyway, and I speak at 300 words a minute. So it might've been when I was speaking at 300 words a minute. It was. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. So I'm either right. writing down notes, trying to keep up or thinking of jokes. <laughs> That's true. You should have heard him. You should have seen him when I was trying to explain to him what a hard money loan is. <laughs> like he could hardly contain himself. Um, uh, that is so all right. true. It's kind of like Mike's hard lemonade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my, yeah. I, I got, I, I was able to throw one of them in there. One of those jokes in there, which yep. was, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which was, um, if, if I'm, if I'm erecting a building and, um, and if, I don't end up and I get a hard money loan. If I don't finish my erection, do I still need to pay the hard money guy off? <laughs> I'm not touching that one with a 10 foot pole. But Casey, why don't you give us the next question? All right. So there was a ratio that I talked about. One twelve. That every, every, every real estate lender, every broker should be focused on because they might not be there when they go to close the loan. What was oh, that yeah. ratio? Um, was it, did it have to do with the Texas, um, you're, you're yeah. there. Yeah. yeah the the Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's ratio, it? that was it. The yeah, Texas, Texas ratio. Oh, that's really what it's called. Percentage of your assets that are going to be devalued. They're risky. As yeah. a percentage of your total capital, if it gets above 10%, 10 percent, yeah. you're out of business. 5% you're kind of bent. And some of them are at like 15, 20%. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, yeah. he gets an extra bonus. He, he gets the bonus question. He That's right. Knows. Now there he's describing go. the walking right. dead. That's yeah, right. There we go. <laughs> All right. We're okay. Back, we're back on top. Last question. And we heard growing up about location. 
Mm -hmm. Casey framed this for us a little bit different, and he gave us uh, the framework of LTC. What does LTC stand for? We've got location, timing, capital. Good job. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Nicely it done. Again. <laughs> yes. I got it. I got it. Come, come on. Give me one more. Give me one more. Give me something that, that was kind of hard that we talked about. Casey, will you give me one more question? Sure. So Bo asked about inflation measures and we talked about CPI and then I talked about the PCE and there was one in between that I said might have to do with daycare and mm -hmm. had three initials. You know, what, what was that one? And it really is the, the thing where that inflation floats into CPI. What was the three letters for that one? Um, are we talking about PPI? There you go. Just what they do in PPI. nursery school. PPI. That's right. PPI. <laughs> PPI, baby. Uh, and then, we, you know, we also talked about PCE, right? yeah. Yeah, personal consumer uh, expenditures and how, you know, they're substituting goods and they're not really looking at that. They're like spending this amount of money, but they're getting chicken instead of steak. <laughs> so no inflation, right? So no inflation. That's right. There's no inflation. They're still spending the same amount. <sighs> Idiots. <laughs> you and Bo love this one. So when I was at the Fed, they would still do uh, go to grocery stores and they would do what a basket of goods costs. They look and see if they still cost the same. Yeah. And so the first one I went on when we were seeing inflation, um, this this economist, I'll, I'll leave him anonymous, said, "See, Casey, Cheerios still cost just a dollar ninety nine." And I said, "Really? How many ounces are in that box versus last time?" There's 12 ounces now instead of 14 ounces. That's freaking inflation. You yeah, idiot. right. <laughs> yes. Unless you want your kids only have breakfast cereal four days a week, that's inflation. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I remember like bottles uh, of soda now all of a sudden have an hourglass yeah. figure. All of a sudden it's like, whoop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and wine, the bottles curved in at the bottom, so you know yeah. there's all kinds of ways that they that they hide things, right? Yeah. Yes. They put, yes, they they put air in the Frito chip, so it looks like a full bag, but it's you know. But then if it gets on an airplane and you take it on, it blows up. So then you find out that wasn't very good. Don't yeah, it's, it awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. It's <laughs> awful. What are they doing to us? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Well, Casey, thank you so much for your time. This is very enlightening. Um, if, if if you had like one thing to say to, um, if you had if you had one piece of advice to give to investors, anybody in commercial real estate, as we come upon what might happen in the next couple of weeks, what what would be a uh, a word of encouragement from uh, Casey Conway if things really go to barbecue, or if it's you know uh, if it goes better than we think, what what's what's a word of advice you would you would give? Yes, yeah, so I go back to the kind of the capital thing. We've got to figure out how to fix capital to our industry. And my recommendation right now for probably the next year, credit unions may be your capital savior. Um, and so we've got more credit unions than we do banks. I've had two deals already that were like, well, at least deals, credible deals that mm. Wells Fargo walked on and Truist wouldn't even quote on. And we, we took it to Delta Credit Union and it got done in 30 days. So uh, the capital side of the credit union, the other thing I'd say, is if you're having trouble um, sleeping in too much, I'll give you one book recommendation. So having so Al Alabama, they don't like these kind of books because there's no pictures in them. They have to have pictures, <laughs> pictures in those. <laughs> this book explains what I just talked about and what I did, Bo, in in, um, uh, in Boston. A great guy, Christopher Leonard, he wrote this New York Times bestselling book at the end of last year. So before all this stuff blew up, it's called The Lords of Easy Money, how the, how the Federal Reserve broke the economy. And he is so spot on. And if you want wow. to understand this, and it's written in good lay language, no academic stuff, um, this is my book recommendation. And if you, if you don't, if that one isn't, isn't good for you. So this is the paper that I published at Alabama. So I had to explain logistics and supply chain to him. So I knew I had to have pictures. So we, my son helped me develop this tr logistics transformer. So you got the that's awesome. And really that is boost. awesome. And so every every section in the report has lots of um, pictures, <laughs> lots of pictures and graphs. And and so this is very Alabama, Alabamian friendly. I guess yeah. 
<laughs> and so I, I know I know how to write for Alabama with lots of pictures, but that book doesn't have a lot of pictures. But if you need yes. pictures, you need to understand supply chain. Here's here's the one I'll send you on on that one. But I like picture books. I I hated going to first grade. They took away all my picture books. I just had a terrible time. Oh my God, <laughs> me too, Casey. We're kindred spirits in that way. Oh, so the last thing I'll tell you is I speak about eighty times a year. And so maybe you can help me with this, Timmy. So people ask, why do you go speak so much and travel around the world? And I said, well, look at for the last ten years. I've been hoping I'd get discovered. So I just did a deal at, uh, in Long Beach. And I said, you know, the next late night show host, you know, that gets fired. You know, we just saw Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon. Maybe they'll oh, yeah. clean out the, the late night show. Bo, Timmy, we could do a late night economics comedy show that could mm -hmm. save America. So I'm hoping <laughs> we could get discovered. So if you, if you find an opportunity, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to create a late night economics comedy show. We, we could do it. <laughs> yeah, I I think so. Let's stay connected on that. There there might definitely be something there. <laughs> making yeah. economics cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. making yeah, yeah, yeah. fun and cool with pictures and and jokes and and uh, no barbecue. And we could have the we could we could have the quiz at the end at about one a.m. before we go off air and see if anybody's still awake and yeah and uh, and, and yeah. look how well Timmy did. I mean, yeah. he did great. Yeah, we'll yeah. turn it into a drinking game and we'll see how good I do at the pop quiz. <laughs> Well, now we so you guys, you guys are in, uh, in Boston. So, Bo, did you go to the spin thing for the Ward Foundation with the ping pong? Oh, I won the tournament. Oh, that's right. You won? I won this the tournament. Hey. You need, you need one of these in Kentucky. So it's a bar with ping pong tables. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was the most fun. I'm sitting there to drink, and I got at least I, – I swallowed at least four ping pong balls with my beer. You know? <laughs> it was, it was, it was, oh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, when you're in Chicago next, come, we got to spin. We got to spin in Chicago. Oh, do so, you really? Wow. Yeah, we cool. do. So yeah, so let's let's go. Let's go. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, Casey. Where can people find you? So uh, our our website is uh, www.redshoeeconomics, and there are two e's, so N of E and the economics dot com. And here's the good news: all my presentations, all my humor, all my research. If you go to the media tab. It's all right there and it's all free so awesome. we make it transparent we make it free um and we even present it to the fed they, they still won't put it in there hmm. in their omc but uh, redshoeeconomics.com and then you know ccim.com has one at ccim.com forward slash insights so all the papers and research that i do there with videos yeah. um, but they make me be more serious bo we, we get less serious on, on our website yeah no, i get it i'm going to the website <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Casey, thank you so much. When we end oh, here, yeah. when we end here, if you can keep your browser open until it'll say it'll be done uploading, just keep that browser open. Um, yep. but, but yeah, um, Bo, in, anything else? That's it, man. Thank you so much for joining us. This was yeah. a blast. This was the most fun I've ever had talking <laughs> economics. No, yeah. not even close. Fun yeah, same. And economics. See, we got to go to Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do. But California. Oh, <laughs> not let's San Francisco. Yeah. Let's do it in Kentucky. Yeah, let's go. We could even do it on a hunt. We could talk economics on the hunt. We could we could shoot at CPI possum. You know, we could uh, yeah. PPI in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could drink some beer, shoot some deer. Uh, we, we'd all be here. Having no fear. <laughs> so, yes. Just rhyme on, man. Rhyme on. Rhyme on. Cool. Hey, hey, I, got, Casey, see, I, got, I got my beagle in the background. So he was oh, real yeah. quiet. You know, so there's there's my beagle. Oh, he's there. Service, so he's yeah. my service dog for my son. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And, and his name, so yeah. you got to give a dog a full name. It's Charlie D. Dog. He's fully, fully, uh, fully there. Charlie D. Dog. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie D. Dog. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool. Only in the South. You got to give him a full proper name and say barbecue sauce. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Casey. Thank you so much. And thanks Thank anybody you. tuning in or tuning in later. Cheers. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I think that's it. Bo. I'm going right, to hit, right, right. hit stop on.